Standing Order 43, the time for members' statements has concluded. Questions without notice. The Deputy Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. It's three and a half weeks since the Therapeutic Goods Administration approved the Pfizer vaccine. The Australian Medical Association has today raised concerns about some basic logistical arrangements for the vaccine rollout, including that not enough GP practices have yet been approved and the government's national booking system isn't ready yet. Can the minister advise when these arrangements will be finalised? The Minister for Health has the call. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I uh, want to thank the uh, member for his question. Shortly before question time, we outlined the next phase of uh, the vaccine rollout. Uh, this is phase 1A. The Pfizer vaccine commences on Monday. Uh, it arrived into the country this Monday. It's been going through the testing processes. It now goes to the rollout process. And in particular, there will be two parts that begin next week. Uh, one, uh, we will have 16 Pfizer hubs around the country. Uh, those were all outlined before question time. Uh, secondly, uh, we will have uh, the facilities, approximately 240 uh, aged care facilities in week one, which we uh, expect and hope to reach. Uh, those are in all states and territories, and uh, in particular, they will be delivered uh, by courier direct uh, uh, to the facilities with surge workforce who are highly trained. Uh, Professor Murphy outlined before question time that there are approximately 500 surge workforce engaged in that part of the process. So that uh, process begins uh, literally in a matter of days. I want to thank all of the states and territories for their work. I think uh, 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 Professor Murphy did say that he regarded this as the largest, uh, most complex vaccination program in Australia's history. Uh, but uh, it is now in that uh, very, very strong position. At the same time, uh, we know that today there were zero community cases nationwide. And those zero community cases mean that we are in a strong position. But having said that, we focus on our most vulnerable. Uh, 240 facilities, 190 towns and suburbs in week one. Uh, we are distributing 80,000 vaccines. We've said that knowing that some may move over into the course of the, uh, the next week and allow, allowing for the early lessons, we are hoping and expecting that at least 60,000 vaccinations will actually be delivered. So that's uh, the course of the Phase 1A uh, program. Phase 1B uh, is when general practices uh, will begin uh, their involvement. Uh, we've had those discussions with uh, practices specifically. I know that uh, Professor Michael Kidd, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, was meeting uh, again as part of a regular series of updates yesterday with general practitioners. I spoke with him this morning uh, and he was holding a webinar with general practitioners. Uh, and so the accreditation process has seen more general practices than we had hoped, which is magnificent. All general practices that meet the standards who have applied for the EOI will be able to participate. We had initially hoped there might be 1,000. Then uh, it, uh, we had hoped it would reach 2,000. Uh, it is now likely to be uh, more than 3,000 general practices, if not more, uh, that are accredited around the country. So I want to thank them. They will play a critical role going forwards. Call the member for Higgins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister please inform the House how the Morrison government's strong economic management is providing a pathway for the Australian economy to generate more jobs and to continue its strong recovery from the international COVID-19 recession. The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, I thank the member for Higgins. and It was good to be with the member for Higgins last week, visiting many of her small businesses in her electorate uh, last week. But can I also acknowledge uh, the former Prime Minister Rudd, who is in the chamber with us today, mm. and particularly this week, as we mark the anniversary of the Closing the Gap statement, which the former Prime Minister delivered from this very dispatch box, and uh, we commend him, as we do each year, on that very significant contribution at that time. Mr Speaker, our economic recovery plan is working. Because today, Mr Speaker, we learned that the unemployment rate fell again, Mr Speaker. It fell to 6.4 per cent from 6.6 per cent. Mr Speaker, what that means is that in January, 
there were 59,000 full-time jobs created in January. 59,000 full-time jobs were created in January. The underemployment rate declined further to 8.1 per cent, Mr Speaker. That is the lowest equal level it has been at since June of 2014. Now, Mr Speaker, this now means that not 80 per cent of the jobs have come back as, after, as a result of coming back from the COVID-19 recession. 93 per cent of the jobs lost during the COVID-19 recession have come back. That means 813,600 jobs have been added in the past eight months. And pleasingly, Mr Speaker, pleasingly, women have taken up the majority of those more, more than 800,000 jobs, as I'm sure the member for Higgins in particular is very pleased, and those small business owners in her electorate, like so many uh, around this country. Mr Speaker, this is welcome news to all Australians to see Australians back in jobs. And that is building confidence in the comeback in the Australian economy that has been building month upon month upon month. And it's particularly pleasing because in January, as we all know, we went through the next transition, the next gear change on JobKeeper and on JobSeeker. And when that occurred, we saw 59,000 full time jobs added to the Australian economy. Mr. Speaker, the Australian economy is getting back up on its feet. And it can have the confidence that we'll continue to receive the support, whether it's on the instant expensing initiatives, whether it's the, uh, the overly successful home builder program, Mr. Speaker, whether it's the work we're doing in manufacturing to build up that for the longer term, Mr. Speaker, the tax cuts which are helping 11 million Australians around the country, as well as for small business, over 250 billion sitting on balance sheets of households and of businesses, which will continue to flow through the economy as that confidence builds. The economic recovery plan is working, Mr. Speaker. The comeback in Australia is well underway. Just before I call the deputy leader of the opposition, just on behalf of the House, can I also formally welcome former Prime Minister Rudd? Good to see you here in the gallery. The deputy prime minister, deputy leader of the opposition. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is, my question is to the Prime Minister. Yesterday, the Treasurer rejected Treasury's expectation that 100,000 Australians will lose their jobs uh, when the Prime Minister's government cuts JobKeeper next month. So, how many people who are now on JobKeeper will lose their jobs when JobKeeper is cut? The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, when we went through the first transition on JobKeeper, the increase in employment in Australia in October was 180,000 jobs. 180,000. And then with the second change, I've just been able to inform you that there were 59,000 full-time jobs that were created. That's net. That's up. That means more jobs. That means more people in employment. That means people people through the course of the COVID-19 recession, as they're coming back, Mr Speaker, if they, if they find themselves in a position, sadly, where they're unable to retain employment in one firm, are able to gain employment in another firm, Mr Speaker, because that's what a growing economy does. This may be lost on the new economic spokesperson taking over from the shadow treasurer, Mr Speaker. This may be lost on him. This may be lost on him, but when there is a net increase in jobs, that means more people are in work. And under our policies, Mr Speaker, more people are getting into jobs. 93 per cent of jobs lost are coming back, Mr Speaker. Now, the only people who seem to be unhappy about the changes that are taking place that are getting more people back into jobs are those sitting opposite, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, our economic plan is working. The recovery plan is working. More Australians are getting back into jobs, and that's happening because of their confidence. And that confidence is building and building and building. And the vaccination program, Mr Speaker, that rolls out from next Monday will continue to build that confidence and ensure that as we go through 2021, 
we will be in an even much stronger position in 2021 that, please, as we there. come back from this COVID-19 recession and the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr Speaker, there are few countries in the world, few countries in the world that can look at their record over the past 12 months as difficult as it has been where we have seen the, the biggest single contraction in our economy exactly. since the Great Depression, Mr Speaker. There are few countries that can say that in their country they have been able to mitigate as much as possible the losses, the dreadful losses of the COVID-19 pandemic, whether that was the loss of livelihoods or the loss of lives. The Australian people know this, Mr Speaker, and they are building in confidence. And no amount of trying to undermine that confidence, Mr Speaker, by the Labor Party will stop the resilience of Australians. I call the member for Cowper. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Will the Deputy Prime Minister please inform the House how the Morrison-McCormack government is driving economic recovery and job creation through its $110 billion infrastructure pipeline? The Deputy Prime Minister. Member for Chifley. <laughs> He's a repeat offender, Mr Speaker, but I do thank the so are member you. for— Just get on with the answer. <laughs> I do thank the member for Cowper for his question. He knows, as all of us do, that the jobs figures were very good today. They're strengthening, they're bolstering, Mr. Speaker, and they're doing that on the back of the infrastructure that we're rolling out across this nation, whether it's in the mid-north coast of New South Wales, wherever it is. Uh, we've got the infrastructure programs and projects happening right now. Workers on the ground shovels in the ground. They're building the infrastructure that local communities need, want, expect, demand and deserve. And communities know that there is a need for immediate and direct and ongoing funding for these programs, for local roads, for local infrastructure, for local communities, which then provides, of course, local jobs. Part of the government's economic stimulus to recover from the global pandemic. Mr Speaker, is the local roads and community infrastructure program. Now, with the Roads to Recovery top up mid last year, uh, this is providing a huge boost to communities right across the country and certainly in Cowper, uh, where, uh, where 30 major community projects across five councils have been funded to support local jobs and local communities. Bellingen Council received $1.3 million as part of these upgrades. Kempsey Shire has received $2.7 million. Coffs Harbour City Council, uh, which also extends into the uh, member for Pages electorate, has received $4.3 million. Uh, Nambucca Valley, $1.8 million. The Port Macquarie Hastings Council, which extends into the member for Lyons electorate, $5.2 million. I see the member for Lyon nodding. He knows also how important this funding is, how important it is for local jobs and uh, Indeed, Coffs Harbour Mayor Denise Knight welcomed the funding for her local government area. And this is what she said. We've got some key large projects happening in Coffs Harbour to upgrade and reclaim recreation space and create vibrant spaces for our residents and visitors to enjoy. <coughs> I thank the Australian Government for this further investment in our region. Councillor Knight knows how important it is for these local jobs to happen on the back of the local funding that we're putting into that fine city. Every council in Australia, all 537 of them are benefiting, are receiving a share of the $1.5 billion of local roads and community infrastructure funding, putting direct stimulus where it's needed, every corner of this nation. We're getting on with the job of making sure that those jobs figures, as the uh, Treasurer talked about earlier, are going to be further bolstered by this stimulus, by this ongoing, by this direct funding. It's creating jobs, indeed, 10,000 jobs, the LRCI, good program, local jobs, local communities being benefited. And I call the honourable member for Greenway. My question is to the Minister for Communications. Given Australia is ranked 61st in the world for fixed line broadband, the cost of the MBN has blown out from $29 to $57 billion. Up to 238,000 premises still can't access minimum MBN speeds as required by law. How on earth were NBN Co executives, management and staff given $78 million in taxpayer funded bonuses? And how much would they have been paid if the MBN wasn't over budget and behind schedule? <laughs> Members on my left. The minister has the call. 
Shadow Minister for her question, which goes to the remuneration arrangements at the government business enterprise set the up by Labor. The minister will pause for a second. The member for Lyons will leave under 94A. The minister has the call. To employ executives from private sector set up by Labor and with a plan at the time to build, to connect to 12 million premises around the country. And you know, when they left government, barely 51,000 premises connected to the fixed line network. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, members on both Mr. sides. Speaker, members on both sides. It is true that there were not bonuses paid when Labor was in government, and I'll tell you why. It's because the performance was so hopeless. They fell so far short of their targets. They were short by 40 per cent, 50 per cent, 60 per cent. And I'll tell you something else. I'll tell you something else, Mr. Speaker. The base salary of the chief executive employed by Labor was 18 per cent higher in real terms than the base salary of the current chief executive. Let's talk about performance. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Speaker, let's talk about how vital it was when this nation was hit by COVID and millions of people moved to working and studying from home overnight, that they had reliable broadband that they were able to connect to. That was absolutely the member vital for Macquarie, to our nation the member for when traffic levels the rose for by 70 per cent during the day, the NBN kept going. The NBN kept going, and Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the NBN now able to connect to almost uh, 12 million premises, uh, almost 8 million premises are connected, and so we're getting on with the job of delivering the NBN. We inherited a chaotic train wreck of a project, a train wreck of a project. We've turned it round. We've got on with delivering it. Uh, and please ask me more questions about the NBN because I'm happy to keep talking about it all day. Just before I call the member for Warringah, members on both sides, again, the level of interjections is too high. I give this warning at about this time every Thursday, I think. Don't be surprised if you're ejected. For interjecting. The member for Warringah. Thank you. My question is to the Treasurer. Paid parental leave is identified as one of the key factors in reducing the gender pay gap. Australia has one of the least adequate paid parental leave schemes. Our scheme offers 18 weeks, while the OECD average is 55 weeks. The Parenthood and Equity Economics released modelling this week, demonstrating a potential increase of up to 4.6 per cent of GDP by implementing a policy of one-year paid parental leave shared equally between both parents. Will you commit to reforming and increasing paid parental leave in the May budget? The Treasurer has the call. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. Our paid parental leave uh, scheme is supporting uh, working women across the country, and what we saw prior to COVID was a record number of Australian women in work. And the honourable member refers to the gender pay gap. In fact, the gender pay gap had closed to a record low of 13.9%. And you know what it was? When Labor, left. when Labor was last in office, 17.4%, Mr. Speaker. 17.4%. So our paid parental leave scheme is providing about 2.3 billion dollars a year, Mr Speaker. Now, we've made some changes over the course of the pandemic, supporting new parents whose employment was interrupted by the pandemic by introducing an alternative paid parental leave work test period for a limited time. Prior to temporarily changing the work test period, parents must have worked 10 out of the, uh, of the 13 months prior to the birth of their child to qualify for paid parental leave. But in November of last year, the government temporarily extended the work test period to require parents to work 10 months out of 20 months for a limited time. Now, the honourable member also references the OECD. Let me point out um, that comparing Australia's paid parental leave scheme with those of the OECD is quite problematic because there's of cross-country differences in the design of statutory paid parental leave schemes and employer 
per provided parental leave schemes. In Australia, parental leave is fully funded through general taxation revenue. This is a non-contributory scheme, which means that all parents who are eligible for government-funded paid parental leave can access this support when needed, in addition to any employer-provided paid leave. Unlike the majority of the members of the OECD, Australia provides a flat rate rather than a replacement wage from a contributive fund, so you can't Treasurer, compare the, the, the two schemes. Treasurer Thank you very much. Mm. You've concluded your answer. The member for Reid. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on the Morrison government's plans to ensure the imbalance in bargaining power between digital platforms and news media organisations is appropriately addressed to ensure public interest journalism remains strong in Australia? The Treasurer has the call. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Reid for a question. Acknowledge her experience as a psychologist in small business and a strong advocate for the people of Reid, who I had the great pleasure to join with her recently, Papa's Patisserie and Five Dock, Mr Speaker, among other business, uh, businesses that we visit, as well as Headspace. Now, Mr Speaker, the member for Reid understands that there is a revolution occurring when it comes to the digital economy, a revolution. It's changing the way we work. It's changing the way we shop and it's changing the way we communicate, Mr Speaker. Now, conscious of that change, back in 27, the then Treasurer and now Prime Minister commissioned the ACCC to undertake a comprehensive review. Now, what the ACCC found in this uh, expanding online advertising market is that it's extremely concentrated and there's an unequal bargaining position between the main players. Now, it's around $9 billion a year in terms of online advertising. It may surprise members to know that of every $100 spent in online advertising, $81 goes to Google and Facebook. $81, $53 to Google and $28 to Facebook. So in light of these dynamics in this sector, the ACCC recommended to the government that we put in place initially a voluntary code. And then when it became clear that we weren't getting um, the cooperation that was needed, we moved, moved to a mandatory code. And that mandatory code has a number of uh, clear features. Uh, it's based on two-way value exchange, two-way value to both parties involved in the negotiations and under the code, as well as a final offer arbitration, uh, arbitration uh, mechanism, Mr Speaker. They're the features of the code, and it's really pleasing that this code being, uh, being worked on has helped brought the parties to the table, so much so that we've seen some positive announcements, including this morning, between News Limited and Google, Doing and positive right announcements Doing on Monday right between Channel 7 and Google, Mr Speaker, and also reports of real progress in negotiations between Nine Entertainment and Google. Now, this is really positive. And we thank Google and we thank the stakeholders for the good faith in which we, they've negotiated. But what we saw today from Facebook Facebook's actions today were unnecessary. They were heavy-handed. They were wrong, Mr Speaker. That was provocative and it was overreach, Mr Speaker, and it will damage Facebook's reputation here in Australia. There was no reason to block access to government sites, sites providing credible information about the pandemic, about emergency services, about mental health. Correct. It was unnecessary to do that. So, Mr Speaker, we say to Facebook that we will continue to work with them, hopefully to find a pathway forward. But what their actions today has done is remind Australians <coughs> about the importance of this code and it's reaffirmed and strengthened the government's resolve to implement it. Yeah. Yeah. The member for Greenway. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Given Christine Holgate lost her job, over $20,000 worth of Cartier watches given as bonuses to executives, what are the consequences for MBN Co paying $78 million in taxpayer-funded bonuses at the depths of the recession? The Minister for Communications. The Minister for Communications will resume his seat, the Manager of Opposition Business, on a point of order. On a point of order, and it goes to the circumstances where the Prime Minister can refer to a minister. Mm. The purpose of that within the standing orders and within practice is where the minister is in a unique position to provide further information. This question goes exactly mm. to the treatment that the Prime Minister gave to Christine Holgate and contrasts it with what NBN Co have done, and there is no additional information on that that can be invited from the relevant minister. 
So this is a. I'll hear from the leader of the house, and, and then I'll deal with. The question, the, assertion, the, the question contains its own assertions as to figures, mm. uh, and usually when Labor asks those sort of questions, those assertions are wrong, and that sort of uh, that sort of ability of is only going to be inside the knowledge of the minister. Member for Oxley, Leader of the Opposition. I'll just say to the Manager of Opposition Business, the, this is an area of, of, of practice, not standing orders. And under the practice, I mean, it's a problematic area, I'll say that. I'll, I'll certainly say it's a problematic area. Uh, and it may well be that, that that is the intent of the practice, that where a Prime Minister can uh, as, as often happens, uh, answer part of the question, uh, refer the rest to the relevant minister, or refer uh, the entire answer to the minister. And uh, the manager of opposition businesses has made his, his point, and that is one part of practice, sort of historically, um, so that if a minister uh, had the detail that the prime minister didn't, the house could be provided with our system of questions without notice directly rather than it automatically uh, being taken on notice. So I understand the point the manager is making. But the other part of practice is it's unqualified, and that is the Prime Minister can choose to refer any question to any relevant minister, uh, it, and it is unqualified. So I appreciate the point the manager is making. But nonetheless, that doesn't prevent the Prime Minister from referring the question. The Minister for Communications. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, as was uh, made clear in the way the government handled the Australia Post matter, uh, there were significant concerns. It was referred to an investigation by the secretaries of the two departments, my department and the Department of Finance, supported by advice from an external law firm. and That advice uh, did indeed uh, a find that there were significant concerns about compliance with the requirements of the Public Government's Performance and Accountability Act. Uh, of course, uh, what is also the case is that the former Chief Executive of Australia Post uh, chose, to, uh, chose to resign. Uh, we, we acknowledge, we acknowledge, uh, we acknowledge on my left. Uh, her performance during her time uh, in that role, uh, but those are the facts. Now, Mr Speaker, in terms of the NBN, I simply make this point that uh, the, uh, uh, a large portion of the number quoted in the media today uh, goes to uh, a very large number of staff across NBN under the terms of their employment. Under the terms of their employment, there is base pay and there is at-risk pay, arrangements which have been in place since Labor set up NBN as a government business enterprise. I remind the House. And uh, the proposition uh, seems to be that uh, in, in some way, uh, when uh, the conditions for at-risk pay to be paid have been met, that in some way uh, the terms of employment should be retrospectively varied by the employer. You can just imagine what Labor would say about that if any large corporate in Australia did that. Uh, I do make the point also that the Minister for Finance uh, has written to the Chief Executive of NBN, uh, as he has to uh, other uh, government business enterprises, drawing his attention to a review of performance bonus arrangements for senior executives and equivalent employees. Uh, that was done before Christmas, and uh, NBN is fully aware of that. I call the member for Sturt. Thank you, sir. My question is to the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts. Will the minister please update the House on how the Morrison government's world-leading legislation is facilitating commercial deals between news media businesses and digital platforms? and how these deals will strongly support the future of public interest journalism in Australia. The Minister for Communications. Well, I do uh, thank the member for Sturt for his question, and I know he has a very strong commitment to a vigorous news media sector in Australia, as indeed does our government. A vigorous and diverse news media sector is an essential element in a modern democracy, and that is a key reason why the then Treasurer and now Prime Minister initiated 
the ACCC's digital platforms inquiry. It's why the Prime Minister and the Treasurer and I and our colleagues have been working to give effect to the recommendations that the ACCC made in that multi-hundred page, very comprehensive report, which started with the premise that there is a significant issue of market power in the market for the, digital advertising. The Minister will resume his seat. The member for Kennedy on a point of order. Uh, Mr Speaker, if a person knows that a, person, a minister is lying, is it my duty to stand up and say that he is lying? Christine Holgate never resigned. The member, now, don't tell lies the, to the House. The member for Kennedy will resume his seat. The Leader of the House. Leader of the House. I think that was one question ago, Mr Speaker. I think it was one question. It took him a little bit of time to get down here. I just... <laughs> well, first of all, we're not going to have those terms bandied around. The member for Kennedy knows full well two things, not to use unparliamentary language and Well, the member for Kennedy can withdraw the word lie and substitute the word he just said, if he wants to. Member for Kennedy. Speaker, I withdraw the word lie and I say he's, he's told an untruth. The member for Kennedy will resume his seat. Having been a member of this House for 28 years, I refer the member for Kennedy to other opportunities in the parliamentary day to engage in political debate. The minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'm pleased to return to the question presently before the House. Uh, and as the Treasurer has pointed out, over recent days we've seen announcements from Seven West Media in relation to striking an agreement uh, with Google. We've seen a story in the Sydney Morning Herald yesterday, of course owned by Nine Entertainment Limited, about that business right, striking yeah. an agreement with Google. Uh, we've seen an announcement again. today that News Corp uh, has announced a brown-breaking agreement with Google. And we welcome these commercial deals because we make the point that the news media bargaining code very specifically is designed to encourage commercial negotiation. Indeed, the policy evil that it is addressing, that it is, addressing is that because of the imbalance of bargaining power, we have not hitherto seen the sorts of commercial agreements you would ordinarily expect. Now, in relation to the conduct of Facebook, uh, in blocking access to many pages today, that clearly raises serious questions. If you say that you object to the News Media Bargaining Code, why would you block the pages of government departments, of emergency services organisations, of the Bureau of Meteorology, of 1800 Respect? These pages would never be covered by the code. Uh, why, have you, why were you uh, so determined to resist the introduction of blocking requirements under our legislation in relation to abhorrent violent material, yet it turns out that you can block thousands of pages of wholly unobjectionable content uh, overnight. Why would you pick on small businesses like North Shore Mums in my electorate? Uh, a founder, Rachel Chappell, told me today she's got 25,000 followers. She found this morning her feed is no longer appearing on the page. Why is it a good idea to respond to a policy measure directed at your market power with an overt display of that market power? And why don't you recognise that our government is committed to this code, we're committed to legislating it, and what we suggest is that uh, Facebook needs to come back to sensible discussion with the government. We've been engaging with all of the stakeholders. We'll continue to do that, but what we will not change is our resolve to legislate this code. The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Why is the government willing to spend $78 million on taxpayer-funded bonuses for NBN executives, management and staff, but has not been willing to extend JobKeeper payments beyond March to save the jobs of Australian workers who still depend on it in sectors such as tourism, live music and the arts? The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, I can advise the... Um the Leader of the Opposition, that uh, the Assistant Minister of the Prime Minister announced a review of performance bonus arrangements 
underway for SES and equivalent employees in the Commonwealth Public Service in November of last year, Mr. Speaker. And in the meantime, while that review is ongoing, the expectation is that agencies will, with access to bonuses, exercise the restraint to the furthest possible extent, Mr. Speaker. And uh, that uh, Minister Birmingham wrote to the NBN last year, reiterating those expectations. Now, Mr. Speaker, I'm asked more broadly about the government's program of providing unprecedented support to Australian workers during the time of the greatest economic crisis this country has faced since the Great Depression. Mr Speaker, our government put in place a targeted, extensive program using existing delivery methods that has resulted in one of the most successful economic policies this country has ever seen at a time of its greatest need. Now, Mr Speaker, for it to be target proportionate and to have a clear exit strategy so it comes into place as, Mr Speaker, the economy gets back up on its feet. And, Mr Speaker, the opposition, when it comes to JobKeeper, they've had a bet each way, the whole way, as they do on everything, Mr Speaker. They say they support it. They say it should be temporary. Prime Minister, resume and when you seek The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Treasurer will cease interjecting. The Leader of the Opposition yes, has the call. Speaker, while irony applies to questions rather than answers, my, my point of order goes to relevance. The Prime Minister was asked about MBN getting $78 million of taxpayer funds for the executives and at the same time not being prepared to extend JobKeeper in sectors like tourism, live music and the arts. That's what the question went to. It went nothing to do with uh, the Labor Party or alternative views. It was a very clear question. I'll call the Prime Minister. That's a member on my left or a member on my left. The Prime Minister is entitled to compare and contrast, which I think he's done, but I think the Leader of the Opposition makes a fair point about the other parts of the question. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition always gets very anxious when I talk no, about his each way bets, <laughs> Mr Speaker, but on the point that he raises. The Prime Minister resume his seat. Manager, manager of Opposition Business. Members on my right. The Manager of Opposition Business. On the standing order requiring members to be addressed by their title, the Prime Minister just referred to each way bets and referred to the Leader of the Opposition when the only person, the only person on my, who has been arguing both sides of the case on wage subsidies was the Prime Minister who said wage members subsidies were right. dangerous. Was the Prime Minister who argued against wage subsidies here on the floor in private meetings and now wants to claim that it was somehow his idea? The Prime Minister has the call. <laughs> I seem to have deeply offended the pressure sensitivities of the Leader the of the Opposition. The Prime Minister, Prime Mr. Minister Speaker, will just I'm sure they will come to the question. Before we get back here on Monday, Mr. Speaker. They can recuperate over the weekend. Prime Minister will come back to the question. Mr Speaker, the JobKeeper program has been the lifesaver for Australians across the course of this pandemic. As those opposite would know, because we, Mr Speaker, have said on numerous occasions that those sectors that continue to, to be subject to very real challenges because of the nature of border closures internationally, whether it's in the travel agent sector or the aviation sector, these sectors, Mr Speaker, they're under close consideration by the government as we look to uh, the months ahead, as we continue to transition uh, the various programs of support that we have in place. Those opposite might want to undermine the confidence of Australians during the pandemic, Mr Speaker. We are building that confidence, and that's why over 50,000 jobs for full-time employees were created in January. That's why 180,000 jobs were created after the first transition of JobKeeper, Mr Speaker. Our policies are working. They're putting people back into work, Mr Speaker. The Labor Party continues to play pandemic politics. Member for Isaacs. The member for Braddon has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Will the Minister outline to the House the outrageous decision taken by Facebook this morning affecting Australians seeking access to critical health information during the ongoing COVID-19 health crisis? The Minister for Health. Thank you very, uh, very much, Mr Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Braddon, who uh, has been a great advocate for veterans' mental health. 
uh, as well as for children's cancer projects such as the Zero Childhood Cancer Project. As part of all of that work, public information is absolutely fundamental. The ability to provide health information, the ability to provide mental health information, the abil ability to provide vaccination information at this critical time. And on this day, we know that a major global corporation has taken a decision which is denying Australians access to fundamental health, mental health and vaccination information. Facebook has taken steps which are unprecedented and reprehensible, unacceptable in a, de in a democracy such as this and an abuse of their power. In particular, the advice that I have is that during the course of the day, government health pages for Queensland Health, ACT Health, South Australian Health, New South Wales Health have all been affected. Dementia Australia has had its fa uh, Facebook page and information affected. Uh, those, I'm advised, thankfully, have in part been redressed. However, as at coming to question time, the advice that I have is that the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne has still not had its fa uh, Facebook feed rectified. MS Australia, uh, Danila Dilba Indigenous Health Service in the Northern Territory that su uh, provides support to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. And in particular, Bowel Cancer Australia and the Kids Cancer Project. The Kids Cancer Project have been blocked. This is outrageous and unacceptable. We expect that Facebook will fix these actions immediately and never repeat them again. This is an assault on a sovereign nation. It is an assault on people's freedom and, in particular, it is an utter abuse of big technologies, market power and control over technology. This will go around the world, but this stops. This is unacceptable. I, I will say this. Apparently, their original mission was to bring the world closer together and to allow people to help share and express what matters to them. Well, that seems to have been replaced by profit over people. We say to Facebook, stop this now, and perhaps it's time to put people over profit. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer to the Prime Minister's answers yesterday. In relation to the reported sexual assault, does the Prime Minister still maintain that his office didn't know, even though in the same answers he said a member of his office did? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, Mr Speaker, I do stand by the statements that I have made in this House all week. And Mr Speaker, as the Leader of the Opposition knows, uh, the, the member of staff that he is referring to was formerly the Chief of Staff to the Minister for Defence um, uh, Industry. And that knowledge related to her time in that role, not in her role in my office. He'd be aware of that, Mr Speaker, and, and seeking to conflate Mem those things, Mr left. Speaker, and to suggest that that, that involves a, no a knowledge of my office, Mr Speaker, um, then, then that would be misplaced and that would be inaccurate. I was asked. Mr Speaker, about the knowledge of, of my office, that is the Prime Minister's office, being informed by other offices about these events, and I've answered honestly about this, Mr Speaker. The last thing I've sought to do, Mr Members Speaker, on my left is to cause to any further Prime distress Minister. in this area. And it's very important that we continue, and I will continue, Mr Speaker, to address these issues as honestly and openly as possible. Mr Speaker, that is what I am doing. That is what the Minister for Defence is doing. That is what the Minister for Employment and Skills is doing, Mr Speaker. And we will continue to do that. Everyone should feel safe in their workplace and be safe in their workplace, Mr Speaker. And I want to advise the House today uh, that uh, to ensure staff are supported at this time, and it has been a traumatic 
I believe, time for staff over the course of this week, as these events have become known to us all, Mr Speaker, that the Department of Finance, through the Employment Assistance Program, is increasing support available to staff, but also to members and senators as well. And from Monday, the 22nd of February, three councillors will be available on site in Parliament House between 8.30 and 5.00 p.m. And councillors will also be available for telephone-based calls via the usual Employment Assistance Hotline, uh, which is 1800 945 145. We are keen to ensure as much support is put in place uh, for the members uh, and senators of this place and their staff. And if there are any staff out there who need to reach out for that counselling and support at this time because of the traumatic events of this week, I would encourage them to do so. Or indeed, if there are any members or senators who wish to do that, that support and service is available to them. The member for Mallee. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Services. Will the Minister please update the House on the extremely irresponsible action taken by Facebook this morning, affecting Australians seeking to access critical and up-to-date information about disaster and emergency services? The Minister for Emergency Management. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Honourable Member for Mali for her question and her concern? about the reckless and irresponsible actions of Facebook this morning to block state emergency service pages, the Bureau of Meteorology, even emergency ABC. And they've done that on a morning in which there was an extreme fire warning issued for Eucla in WA. And in fact, there are flood warnings for the Tully and Murray rivers in North Queensland. They have issued those tried to issue those today through a platform that has been used and has evolved as Facebook has evolved and been an important conduit in providing that critical information to those people in disaster areas. Let me make this clear. The legislation that passed this House and is now going to the Senate does not impose any financial burden on Facebook for the use of government information, particularly from emergency services. So the actions in which they have taken is reckless. It is reckless even more so in the fact that it has not even got royal assent and is not even in place. It is an overreach for which Facebook has undertaken recklessly to put Australians' lives at risk. It is important that we continue to work with them because it is important to also understand, as many in this place would understand, that Facebook can also be a place where misinformation is placed, particularly in times of natural disaster. And any state emergency service will tell you that one of the key pieces of resources that have to be deployed during a natural disaster is monitoring the information that's put up on Facebook during a time of natural disaster to make sure that that, can be, that truth can be rectified. And in fact, you need a single source of truth. That's why these sites are so critical to the Australian public in times of natural disaster. And I'm proud to say that this morning the communications minister made representation to Facebook. And as we speak, we are slowly but surely seeing those sites, those pages come back online because of the direct intervention by the communications minister with Facebook to ensure that those pages are placed back up so that the Australian public can have that confidence in state emergency services and the Bureau of Meteorology being able to issue warnings as they require. But let me say this, the Australian people and its government will not be bullied by some big tech company that is putting people's lives at risk and putting profits ahead of people. I call the honourable member for Sydney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Yesterday, Peter Credland said there was no way a Prime Minister or his office wouldn't know about an alleged sexual assault in a minister's office. Ms. Credland says the claim the Prime Minister and his office weren't told doesn't stack up and, quote, doesn't smell right to me. Does the Prime Minister stand by his story? The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, I've answered these questions honestly and openly in this place, and the statements I've made to this House about all of these issues are as exactly, Mr Speaker, as they are to, to, to my knowledge, Mr Speaker. And I continue to stand by those statements and will, because, I, as I said in this place yesterday, the advice that we had in dealing with this matter, when it was a matter for the now Minister for Defence, but then Minister for Defence Industry, um, the Minister at the time um, arranged for Brittany to meet with the police. She respected her wishes as they were expressed to her, and we at all times sought to provide support 
in the best way we possibly could. Now, Mr Speaker, as I said earlier this week, clearly over the passage of time, Brittany has felt that uh, that support was not sufficient. And Mr Speaker, that is what we have to address. We have to learn from this. That is why the uh, inquiry and process that has been set up across parties all across this place will be there to try and ensure that these supports Mr Speaker, uh, pick up all the lessons of this and, and, other, and other issues, Mr Speaker. But I would say to this to members of this House and in the other place, if there is any suggestion here that this is not an issue, uh, or if there is any suggestion that this issue is confined to any one party in this place, if there is a suggestion Member, of that, members Mr. On Speaker, my left. then, Mr Speaker, I think that's a false suggestion. I think we all understand that. We're working to put a process in place, the Leader of the Opposition and I and other leaders and the crossbenchers, to ensure that we can make sure, Mr Speaker, as best as we are all able, that this would not happen again. That is our goal. We share that goal. That is my goal. And I believe that's what Brittany would like us to achieve as well. And I'm committed to that, Mr Speaker. Members on my left. The member for Lindsay has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment and the Minister representing the Minister for Women. Will the Minister please update the House on the shameful and irresponsible action taken by Facebook this morning, affecting Australians seeking access to critical information on weather forecasting and warnings? And this one is truly distressing. Information on counselling services for victims of domestic violence. The Minister for the Environment and Minister representing the Minister for Women. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the member for Lindsay for her question and commend her on her swift action in her local community when she found in this sort of capricious way that Facebook had taken down the pages of community groups that she's close to, a group that provides housing support and uh, the distress that that then flowed on that she reported to me early, particularly in the case of 1800 Respect. Uh, Mr Speaker, people rely on being able to access information and they develop trust in the platforms that provide it. Particularly in rural Member and regional Australia, Facebook has been many things. It's been a community bulletin. It's been a lifeline during the pandemic. It's been a way of communicating with family and friends when there has been no other way. And I have to say that that trust has been badly breached. We are, as I said, in the middle of a pandemic, and it's utterly irresponsible for Facebook to remove access to web pages or block their content, particularly in the case of 1800 Respect and the Bureau of, Meteorolo the Bureau of Meteorology. Um, on the matter of 1800 Respect, can I encourage anyone who feels unsafe or who would like to speak someone about this to call 1800 Respect? or visit 1800respect.org.au. Over the last year, the total contacts to 1800 Respect have been more than 6,000 a week, highlighting how crucial it is for people escaping domestic violence and seeking advice on sexual assault and associated violence. 1800 Respect and the Morrison government are, of course, utilising other methods to communicate this national helpline with those in need. But I come back to my main point. If you're used to receiving information on your Facebook feed, that's what you come to rely on. As the Minister for Agriculture said, Facebook has also affected the Bureau of Meteorology. The bomb, uh, as it's affectionately known by all Australians, uses Facebook as a communications channel, with posts and video content complementing the website and the app's official warnings and forecasts, particularly during severe weather. Cyclones can strike without warning, fire weather warning, sheep graziers alerts. People come to rely on this popping up in their Facebook feed and giving them the information they need at a time of crisis. Can I say the Bureau's Facebook page has 894,000 followers, the third largest audience for a government Facebook page in Australia. All forecast warnings and other critical information are, of course, at the Bomb Weather app, and I take this opportunity to ask that people download it. Mr Speaker, when, as a multi-billion dollar corporation, you enter into the world of information platforms, you walk into responsibility as well as profit. The message we received today is that responsibility is arbitrary at best, heavy-handed at worst. Our resolution, as the Minister for Communication has said around the media bar bargaining code, is strong, but we want access to community and safety the information. Minister, time has concluded. The honourable member for Sydney. 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Yesterday, Brittany Higgins issued a statement in response to the Prime Minister's remarks. In that statement, Ms Higgins said, and I quote, the continued victim blaming rhetoric by the Prime Minister is personally very distressing to me and to countless other survivors. How does the Prime Minister respond to Ms Higgins' statement from yesterday? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, Mr Speaker, the last thing I would want to see is to add any further distress to what Brittany is already going through, Mr Speaker. And I am doing everything I can to ensure that that is the case in how we seek to handle these issues. Members Mr. on my Speaker. left. I'm very sorry she feels that way, Mr Speaker. I know she must be under tremendous stress over the course of this week. She has shown great courage and great bravery in speaking up over these matters, Mr Speaker. I've been listening to what she's been saying. And, Mr Speaker, I'm seeking to put in place arrangements, whether it's the support of staff who are here in this building here and now and uh, will be feeling, I think, increasingly fragile or vulnerable because of the nature of these events that have um, arisen this week. And the best way I can, I think, address those comments is to ensure that I'm doing everything within my power, Mr Speaker, to try and make this a safer place. The member for Solomon. The member for Groom. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Will the Minister please outline to the House how the Morrison government is supporting Australia's manufacturing industry and creating jobs as we continue our recovery from the COVID-19 recession? The Minister has the call. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Groom for his question. And he knows that this government is getting on with the job of delivering for our manufacturing sector mm -hmm. to help them to rebuild and to create the jobs in one of the toughest years that they have experienced on record. Now, our Manufacturing Modernisation Fund is just one of the immediate ways that we're backing our manufacturers and their workers. Now, I joined the member for Groom late last year to open round two of the Manufacturing Modernisation Fund at Pixie Ice Cream in the electorate of Groom. Now, they are a fantastic manufacturer. And Many Aussies may not know that they are responsible for the iconic home ice cream brand. Now, Pixie is a great example of what many of our manufacturers are doing right across the country, which is looking at technology, how they can upgrade their technology so that they can introduce efficiencies to their manufacturing processes. And that is exactly what the Manufacturing Modernisation Fund is all about. Now, Round two closed on the 21st of January, and there's been a tremendous response to that. There have been over 500 applications received. Now, this builds on the success of round one of that fund, where we supported over 200 uh, projects, uh, and that was worth about $215 million in support that we gave to those manufacturers. And that supported them at a particularly difficult time uh, during the height of COVID last year. So the Manufacturing Modernisation Fund is part of our $1.5 billion modern manufacturing strategy that we announced in October last year. And work is well underway on delivering on the key parts of that strategy. Firstly, with the Manufacturing uh, Modernisation Fund Round 2, which is currently being uh, assessed, but we also committed to make sure that roadmaps were uh, developed by April of this year, that guidelines were developed, that we were opening the funding rounds. All of that work is well on track so that we can deliver the longer-term support <coughs> that our manufacturers need. Now, let's be clear, Mr Speaker, this strategy is not about a short-term sugar fix. This is about setting up Australian manufacturing for the future. We have taken a long-term view and we have looked clearly at what manufacturers need in this country to be able to succeed. We are helping them to build resilience, to build competitiveness and build scale. And we are doing that in our six national manufacturing priority areas. We are supporting manufacturers. We always have. We always will. The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Yesterday, Brittany Higgins issued a statement which said a current senior staffer to the Prime Minister 
and Ms Higgins, former Chief of Staff, the same person, quote, continually made me feel as if my ongoing employment would be jeopardised if I proceeded any further with the matter. Has the Prime Minister raised Ms Higgins' clear statement with his staff member? The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, there have been many conversations about this over the course of this week in relation to these issues, and that is why I have asked the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet to follow through on this process, Mr Speaker, to, to look at these matters and to provide me and the Cabinet with advice on how we can um, ensure that in these horrendous situations, Mr Speaker, that the best possible support can be provided, Mr Speaker, and that is what um, everyone in this situation was seeking to do in the best of faith. But, Mr Speaker, as we have stated... The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Yes, yes Mr Speaker. Um, it can't be a clearer question. The question just goes to whether the Prime Minister has asked his senior staff member about the declaration made by Ms Higgins about whether that is accurate, whether he has raised it with the member of his own staff. Surely we can get an answer to that. Ms Higgins deserves one. The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, perhaps the Leader of the Opposition did understand me. What I'm saying is I have had these conversations, Mr Speaker, with the member of staff. Members on my I left. said there'd been many conversations. I'm happy to indicate that I've had conversations about the support provided uh, by the member of my staff now. Um, she, Mr Speaker, was working as the Chief of Staff to the Minister for Defence Industry at the time. Now, I have discussed those matters with her and the support provided, and she indeed has um, indicated to me um, some appreciation that was also provided to her at the time in the messages that were sent to her. Now, Mr Speaker, we all accept that Brittany no longer feels in any way that she felt supported, particularly over a pr prolonged period of time, well beyond that initial incident, Mr Speaker where initially um, the advice was followed. I, I note that the Australian Human Rights Commission says, if an employer suspects that a criminal incident has occurred, the individual should be advised to report the matter to the police. And that is indeed what the minister did at the time and arranged for Brittany to have that meeting with the AFP. And that occurred, Mr Speaker, on the 1st of April. That was followed up by a meeting uh, between Minister Reynolds and the AFP Assistant Commissioner. Now, Mr Speaker, everyone here tried to do the right thing. They took advice and followed the advice, and they sought to provide that support. And this is what the challenge here is for us. Even when that has been done, it hasn't done the job, because now Brittany clearly feels that way. And that is not disputed. And that is what we are seeking to apply our attention to, to ensure we learn from that and that others are not in a position where they are faced with this again. That is simply what we're trying to do. That is simply what we're trying to do, honestly and openly. The member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. Will the Minister outline to the House how the Morrison government is continuing to drive down power prices as we continue our recovery from the COVID-19 recession? The Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Boothby for her question. And as someone with a family farming background, she knows how important affordable, reliable energy is to ensure that small businesses can make ends meet, can invest and can employ, Mr Speaker. Now, we're seeing report after report telling us that energy prices are coming down and that they've coming, been coming down since well before the onset of the pandemic. The ACCC's latest gas inquiry found that gas prices offered for 2021 this year have fallen by as much as 50 per cent over the last two years, Mr Speaker, 50 per cent reduction. And we know that lower gas prices are also helping to support the reduction in electricity prices. We've seen eight consecutive quarters of CPI reductions in electricity, 10 consecutive quarters in the, uh, the member for Boothby's electorate, Mr Speaker. And a new report released by the AER confirms that the falls in wholesale electricity prices across the national electricity market were up to 58 per cent lower. They've fallen by 58 per cent since 2019. And with household
prices making up to a third to a half of a bill. That's big savings that can flow through to consumers. Now is a great time to shop around and get a good deal. And a great way to do that is to go to the Energy Made Easy website, where you can compare your bill with bills that could come from other plans and the savings that are up for grabs. Now, uh, we've also put in place several years ago our default market offer to make sure that reductions are passed on con to consumers even when you don't have time to shop around. And that means that compared to before the introduction of the default market offer, a family in Clarence Park in the members' electorate could be now up to $707 a year better off, $707 a year. And a cafe in Mitcham <coughs> could be over $6,000 better off, Mr Speaker. And this is all part of our plan to bring down energy prices. Over the longer term, we know that critical to doing this whilst we bring down emissions is technology. Mr Speaker. And just last week, the Biden administration established a new advanced projects research agency allocating an initial $100 million towards technologies with stretch goals, including energy storage, low-cost clean hydrogen, carbon capture, low-emission steel, soil carbon. If that sounds familiar, Mr Speaker, it's because they're the same five priority areas in our technology investment roadmap, Mr Speaker. We know, we know that we need to be evaluating any technology, Mr. Speaker, any technology that can bring down emissions and deliver affordable, reliable energy for all Australians. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister accept that he and his office have a human resources responsibility for all ministerial staff? Has the Prime Minister asked his principal private secretary whether he checked in on Brittany Higgins, as Ms Higgins has clearly stated. The Prime Minister has the call. I have, Mr Speaker, and I have advised the House about when my office knew about these matters in accordance with the advice that I've received. The, the member for Herbert. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia. Will the Minister please update the House on the resilience of the Australia's resources export and highlight how the industry, with the support of the Morrison government, is driving economic growth and supporting everyday Australians? The Minister for Resources, Water and the Northern Territory. Well, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the member for Herbert for his question? Another fighter for the North, another strong supporter of the resources sector. And Mr Speaker, what we know is the resources sector continues to be the backbone of the Australian economy. It has been, it is, it will be into the future. It will continue to grow and drive jobs all through the hard work of everyday Australians who are out there every single day in their high vis working on behalf of their companies and our country. So, Mr Speaker, the resources sector will always be a key driver of our economy, particularly for regional Australia. And it's great to see another increase in job numbers today, another increase in employment. Uh, in fact, in Queensland, Mr. Speaker, November last year, the resources sector actually supported 78,000 direct jobs. The sector grew 17.9 per cent over the year and 22.7 per cent for the quarter. Now, Mr. Speaker, I say to all of those Australians who might be looking for jobs, Get yourself out to the regions. There's plenty of jobs. You can certainly get employment. As the Deputy Prime Minister has said, you might find love, you might not, but you can definitely get a job in a sector like the resources sector. So, Mr Speaker, in 2019-20, Australia exported over $102 million of iron ore. That is enough iron ore to build, to build 10,000 harbour bridges. 10,000. It's also driven dividends for those mum and dad investors. Uh, we will continue, continue to support the sector as it supports us. Now, for the states, Mr. Speaker, what's it mean for them? Well, it means $8 billion for royalties for Western Australia, $3.5 billion for Queensland, $1.5 billion for New South Wales, money that pays for schools and hospitals and roads. And Mr. Speaker, we will continue to support the sector. But I want to give a shout out to Kenzie. Kenzie is a 22 year old apprentice electrician. Kenzie works in the Bowen Basin. Uh, and this week I received a number of emails from those hardworking men and women in the sector, including Kenzie. So I gave Kenzie a ring before question time. Uh, apprentice electrician, I go anywhere, Mr Speaker. You never know where you might find one. As a former electrician, who thought you'd end up here in the parliament? Uh, but you know, for those who don't know, Kenzie's working underground, working underground mine. It's deep, it's hot, it's dark, it's difficult work. 
A bit Kenzie ensures the big fans stay on, the equipment keeps running, he literally keeps the lights on. So to Kenzie and all of his colleagues, we are so thankful for the work that you have done over the last 12 months. You have helped drive our economy, you have kept yourselves employed, you have kept yourself safe, you have managed the pandemic, you have done everything that has been asked of you. Now, Kenzie is a great supporter of his industry. He is proud of what he does, as he should be. Uh, and I say to all of Kenzie's colleagues right across Queensland, right across Australia, once again, thank you for your service in such an important sector as the resources sector. And Kenzie, you can count on us to support you. You can count on us to continue to support the sector. We will not be out there arguing against resources, Mr Speaker. We want more, not less. More jobs, not less. And we'll drive it forward. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. But before we break, and I've discussed this with the Leader of the Opposition, and I'm sure the member for Griffith would uh, agree. Uh, Mr Speaker, on Dulles indulgence, I wish us all to take a moment to remember Hannah Clark and her three children. Uh, Alia, um, Liana and Trey. Uh, tomorrow marks one year since that vile and terrible crime, that terribly violent crime, unspeakable, unthinkable, was committed against them. Mr Speaker, in response to that crime last year, I said in this place that the words family violence just jar. Those words should never be together, but sadly are, oh so often. Those words have nothing to do with each other because our families should be the safest place in all of the world. But for so many, including in this place, Mr Speaker, that has not been the case. And that is a profound sadness. Sadly, this was absolutely not the case for Hannah and her children and for so many others. All we can do this year later is extend our love to Hannah's family and seek to reach out to them and I extend to them through the member for Griffith uh, the House's kindest regards and deepest affection and commend her again for how she led us all a year ago. The most important thing we can do in this place is of course do everything we can. As the Leader of the Opposition I know these issues are above politics, thankfully. And we must do all we can to do to prevent family violence and to support those suffering it. Working together with the states and territories across this chamber on the next national plan to reduce violence against women and their children, uh, to produce more support for women in particular, most at risk and their children of experiencing family, domestic and sexual violence. Hannah, Alia, Liana and Trey, we remember you. We will never forget. <laughs> and the Leader of the Opposition on indulgence. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I join with the Prime Minister in commemorating, tragically, the first anniversary of the deaths of Hannah Clark and her three lovely children, Alia, Leana and Trey. We still see their faces in photographs and we see their joy. We see the love in which they all so happily embraced each other. And we see in their eyes the sense of a future so bright and so eagerly anticipated, a future that was stolen from them. As our shock turned to sorrow, we came together to remind ourselves that we cannot resign ourselves to this. We in this House have a particular responsibility when it comes to issues of family law, taking action about domestic violence, taking action on these issues uh, we have an opportunity to make a difference. We cannot be bystanders, not now, not ever. Let us be guided every day by their memory and let them never fade. Amen. I thank both the Prime Minister and the Leader of the